So I think we're on, Mary. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Yes, we are on. Hi, everybody. So I just thought you the podcast. This is like breaking news podcast, of course, from your law firm, of course, at Silmi Law. And we all know, um, Silmi, and we're very happy um, that he took some time from his very busy schedule to tell us um, all about um, the August 2023 um, visa bulletin, which just came out um, yesterday. Attorney Sharif, your thoughts, please. Great. So uh, thank you, Mary. Thanks for the opportunity um, to have this conversation. Obviously, um, there have been a lot of questions from folks out there regarding the um, bulletin and, you know, implications of the bulletin. Um, those who are, um, you know, from India are particularly affected or impacted and, you know, other countries as well. Um, so what I'm hoping we can do is we, you know, last night I jumped on for a little bit on live and talked a little bit about just like India specific issues. But, um, you know, I think if you, you know, can maybe, um, you know, kind of share some of the questions you have as we go along uh, that you've been receiving as well, then uh, hopefully we could have, um, you know, a good, a good conversation here. So with regard to the visa bulletin, first, I just want to explain what exactly the visa bulletin is. So the uh, visa bulletin is issued by the State Department. And essentially, there are limitations on the number of visas that are available for each category of, and I'm just going to talk about employment-based immigration. So for each category of employment-based immigration, there are uh, limitations on the numbers of available visas. There are also limitations on how many visas are allocated to each specific country. So all countries have a cap where it uh, cannot exceed, um, I, I don't know the exact number, something around 7.5%, I think it's 7.4% of all available visas for the uh, specific category. So of course, the, you know, high, very high demand um, of, you know, talented workers and highly skilled professionals from India puts great pressure on the availability of those, um, you know, visa numbers. And what happens is essentially in the categories of employment-based immigration, where there is a lot of interest, a lot of folks who are, you know, in the U.S. or immigrating to the U.S. are, uh, for the most part, already in the United States on H-1B visa, temporary uh, worker visas. They have already been sponsored by an employer for their I-140, or they have a self-petition, such as a national interest waiver, right? Um, I'm speaking specifically about like the majority of people from India right now. So those individuals, they have a very long wait time before they're able to adjust status to a green card. This is always this has been the case for a decade. Now, we um, obviously move many, many people, thousands of people from the EB2 and EB3 categories where you have those many decade long now wait times for, uh, you know, eligibility to file for a green card or adjustment of status um, to the first category. Or if someone, particularly from India or China, is seeking to immigrate to the U.S. and they are highly skilled and uh, at the very, you know, uh, top level of the field, or we can kind of move them toward that direction, then, you know, we're, we're trying to position them for EB1 category because that is the faster moving employment-based category. There's something like 83,000 visas available for each category and um, almost all of them get used up traditionally. About 98 and a half percent are utilized. Now in fiscal year 2022, in the EB1 category, only 53,000 were used. So there was a, a lot of waste, and that was largely due to the COVID pandemic 
and um, you know the individuals who are coming from outside of the U.S. weren't issued visas. And then, um, so coming into fiscal year 23, there was a lot of things going on. But one thing in particular that I think impacted um, the availability of EB1 for India in particular is that there are a lot of EB1C individuals who, um, you know, were waiting because of the COVID situation and then were issued visas in fiscal year 23. Plus, you have a policy change within the administration that is seeking to make sure that all available visas are being used and specifically that they are used within the first nine months of the fiscal year so that they are not scrambling in the very end of the fiscal year trying to um, you know, utilize the available visas. So presently, this is the August bulletin. That is the second to last month of the fiscal year. So you're going to have August, and then you're going to have September, and then it's going to reset. What we learned yesterday is that there are no more available visas for the rest of the fiscal year, all right, for those who are from India. That is why if you look at the dates, it's not only that it's retrogressed, like people are like, oh, it retrogressed 10 years. It didn't retrogress 10 years. They just put a date that basically says nobody can apply. That's they just said, stop applying. August, September, we're not going to accept applications for adjustment of status from EB1 India. That's the message. So don't take it as 2012 and January and counting months and all this. This is that's nonsense. This is about simply uh, mathematical reality that there are no more available visas for EB1 India for the remainder of the fiscal year. What that means is October. So October bulletin will come out in essentially mid-September. We'll know what's going on with October bulletin. My prediction is that the October bulletin will go back to what we were seeing in July. So if you look at the July bulletin, you know, here you have the, we're showing you guys the August final action dates, right? So August financial final action date is January 2012, right? So uh, for EB1, January 2011 for two and January 2009 for three. What it really means is don't apply. We cannot process any more visas. They've all been used for the remainder of the fiscal year. So October 1st, it's going to reset. That's very clear. All right. So I just want everybody to understand that going forward also. So this is, you know, we're in fiscal year 23 right now. We're two months remaining in fiscal year 23, two and a half months. By the way, side note. I would also not be that surprised if they apply the August bulletin dates to the remainder of July. I mean, we are sending out adjustment of status cases for folks who are whose date is current in July and, you know, they would be accepted. Uh, we don't have anything to indicate that they will not be accepted, but if they do not accept it because they say your date is not current because we're taking the, uh, you know, dates from, uh, uh, August, it wouldn't be a shocker. I wouldn't be shocked. So, so that's, uh, just a side note. All right. Um, is that clear so far? Um, yes. Although we do have like, I'm, I'm getting, I'm receiving a few texts, messages, and emails. So many of um, our clients, um, we appreciate your, your questions, right? But before you become anxious, you know, it's, it's great that we have attorney Sharif guiding us. So one of the um, questions that I got attorney Sharif, so since you're flashing, um, um, I think the first of the two charts for um, employment-based um, categories. So some of the clients yeah, so this me, is So this is the mm -hmm. final action date for employment-based preference, right? Yes. So, but then if you scroll down, there's a second chart, right? So it kind mm -hmm. of confuses them, kind of confuses me too. Like, where should they look? Should they look here? Yeah, or it's confusing. It's then? confusing. The whole thing is confusing. So you have final action dates for employment-based cases, right? Yeah. If we go down, mm -hmm. you have dates for filing of employment-based visa applications, right? 
Yes. And, um, you know, and, and here you, you know, the dates look a lot nicer. They look a lot better. You know why we want these dates, right? Well, you know, actually for the, for our listeners, I think for the most part who are already in the U S I would say 90% are already in the U S maybe 10% are outside of the U S. Um, so for the, first of all, for those who are already in the United States, this bulletin is irrelevant. It doesn't matter at all. Don't need like filing date is worthless to you. As far as the remainder of the fiscal year, it is completely and totally irrelevant. It has no, uh, you know, uh, no impact on you or anything that you do. Why do I say that? Right. It's because you are planning to do adjustment of status because you're already in the United States. You're not seeking to file a, for a visa at a U.S. consulate abroad. If you are filing for a U.S. visa at a consulate abroad, these are the dates where you could file your application. The final action date is the date that you would actually be issued your visa. So that's the difference between filing date and final action date. Filing date is the date that you could apply. Final action date is the date that you can receive. All right. Okay. So like simply put, for example, I mean, I'm looking here at the, um, the second chart, right? So basically if I, um, you know, Philippines, Mexico, I'm from Pakistan, I'm from other countries except China and India. Um, there's nothing stopping me from filing and let's say an EB1A with an adjustment of status, right? So no, that, so this, these current dates are mm -hmm. current for filing a visa, which if means you are from the, so if you are from the, it, it doesn't mean that you'll receive a visa. It just means that you could apply for one and they will not reject your, your package. They won't reject your, your package. Now, now. I want to be very clear. We're mm -hmm. that's talking. That is where you're filing for a visa outside of the U.S. That's called a DS-260. That is filed at a consulate abroad. All right. So you're filing at a consulate abroad. Then you know you are essentially um, doing so through the State Department. You're filing your visa, so you could file a visa. Like, for example, I'm from the Philippines. I have my EB1A approved. I could, and I'm sitting in Manila. I could file a DS-260 visa but application okay. to the Department of State. And that's, you know, fine and dandy. Now, if, if you are in the U.S., if you are on an H-1B, if you are on any kind of visa in the United States, and you are, you have your visa approved, Right then we have to look at your priority date. What is the pr priority date is the date that your application was received by USCIS. That is your priority date. Whether So if you do, for example, some people want premium processing. Premium processing will not change your priority date. If, for example, you submit a EB1A or a, you know EB2, any kind of I-140, the priority date will be based on the date that the government receives your petition okay the uh philippines or mexico or you know uh even china or any other country right those dates if you filed your your i-140 before these dates if it, i'm sorry if it was received before these dates then you are eligible for um adjustment of status so if i am from Pakistan, and my um, EB1A was filed in, you know, uh, July, right, of 23, then I can apply for adjustment of status still. All right. It's practically current. It's just retrogressed to the beginning of the month, to August. Okay. So, for example, if I... Um... I'm um, from Mexico, I'm from, from the Philippines, and I file my EB1A with an adjustment of status and the service receives it, let's say, August 28th of this month. This month. It, it's, it's, there's not going to be a problem, right? A problem, right? There and is a, a problem. A, there is a problem because your I-140, if they receive your I-140 on 28th of 
I'm sorry, 28th of July, there's no problem. If it's oh, yeah. 28th as long of as August, it's August, okay. As long as it's before August 1st, then oh, you're wow. fine. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, then, now, the thing about it is like, if you're, so your date is current. Um, if it's, if your I-140 is received before August 1st, 23, and you're all other countries, your date is still current. All right. Um, now, for those of you who are EB2 NIW, right? EB2 NIW, your date of uh, is April 2022. So that is when your adjustment of status can be uh, processed. So that means that if you filed your national interest waiver case before April 1st of 2022, then presently they would adjudicate or process your uh, adjustment of status, your green card, right? If you filed your case after April of 2022 and you are from any country in the world, then you your case is just it's it's on hold but i would say for those individuals you're probably going to be okay in october because that's when the new visa you know uh get get plugged in and the dates would likely advance further so um you know again for the rest of the fiscal year if so let's say somebody's just i woke up today and i said i want to file a national interest waiver and i am from any country, I'm from, uh, you know, Mali. I'm from Timbuktu, Mali in Africa. There's no specific country problem. It's all countries. And I want to file a national interest waiver while I'm, you know, uh, doing my OPT after completing a uh, master's of science, right, in, in the United States. So I'm in the U.S. I'm I have an OPT and I decided I want to file an I-140 EB-2 NIW. I could file the I-140 NIW. I can have it approved on July 14th, 2023. Okay. So now I have an approved NIW. What's my problem? Do you know the problem, Mary? Um, the problem is the, um, the dates. The dates. The dates. The problem is the date of EB2 is yeah. April 2022, yeah. and I filed my case July 23. Therefore, okay. Okay. I cannot file for my adjustment of status because oh, so, so, my. Okay, so let me um, cut you there. So you said filed, right? It does. It's. It does not follow. It. It does not follow the approved date, right? It's the filing date that they follow for the priority okay. dates, right? That's a very good question. The USCIS. And this even this is why it's so complicated. People are confused. USCIS, if you want to know when to adjust your status, go from, uh, you know, like this Malayan individual who did his NIW in July, right? So he wants to know, or she wants to know, when can I file for my green card? I'm sitting in the U.S. I don't want to go back to Timbuktu, and I want to file for my green card, right? So when can they file their green card? Well, according to the chart, it's April 1st, 2022. But wait a minute. This is final action date. Filing date, right? Filing date is, is better. It's a better time. Why can't I use the filing date? The reason why you cannot use the filing date is because USCIS tells you that you can't use the filing date. And that is because there is here... And I'm going to share a new tab. This is the adjustment of status filing charts from the visa bulletin. So for those of you who are in the United States, this is the controlling information. The State Department bulletin that I was just showing you that everybody looks at and is the only thing that people are concerned with is actually not the, um, the, the uh, like, authoritative information. Because what happens is USCIS determines how many visas are available for the fiscal year. And they will state on this page that you may use 
dates of filing chart, or otherwise we will indicate that you must use final action dates. So every single month, they could possibly change. One month, it might be final action date. One month, it might be dates of filing. So for example, in October, they're probably going to stay, you could use dates of filing. Right now, okay. they're, they're, right now, it's the end of the fiscal year. So they want to be tight. They want to be They've already issued enough visas or they they calculate that by the end of the fiscal year, they're going to be done. Therefore, they say you right now use it, We're using final action date. Right. So look what it says. Current month adjustment of status filing charts. OK, next month. So what do we want? We want August 2023 uh, final action. Right. So here's final action. When to file. And if you go down, employment-based, final action dates, right? Employment-based, first, see, they're using the final action date. So this is the uh, authoritative information for anyone who's already in the U.S. And you could see India, first category is January 1st, 2012. Second category is January 1st, 2011. Third category is January 1st, 29. They're just saying, guys, we can't do anything for the next two months. That's what USCIS is saying. All right. So there's the, this is actually the bulletin that people should be looking at. They shouldn't even be looking at the State Department bulletin. If you're in the US, if you're in the US and you're going to do an adjustment of status, this is the bulletin that you look at. You don't look at the State Department bulletin. It's just going to confuse you because everybody's looking at the State Department bulletin and saying, why can't I use five? Uh, uh, filing date. I mean, I had 10 people ask me, can you please, um, you know, just file my case now, even though it's not even close to qualifying because that's the way I could take advantage of the filing date. And what do you mean? Take advantage of the filing date. You're sitting in San Francisco, or you're sitting in Washington, DC, or you're sitting in New York. What filing date are you talking about? Oh, the filing date, the filing date, the filing date doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the adjustment of status date if you're in the US. All right. So if you're in the US, first category, India, right now, look, th the reason why these all are the same, right? January 1st, January 1st, January 1st, 9, 11, 12. It, they're just picking, they're, they're just saying we can't process right now. They could have done you, they could have done you. Mm -hmm. You mean, we're done, right? But okay. they just they want this is just, uh, you know, they don't want to set a precedence probably. So they just, you know, retrogressed it to the point that nobody could apply. So we're not going to see any new um, availability of adjustment of status uh, folks for, you know, India until new fiscal year, October, uh, which we'll know in September. And that's that's fiscal year 24 starts in October. Now, the other thing I would just point out and uh, you could stop sharing. I think did did I get the point across this time? You think, Mary? Yeah, I think I so. Know. Yeah, <laughs> but like if you have more questions, it's okay. But uh, I mean, the, I think the bottom line here is you have to get an attorney. Like attorney, sure you sell me, right? Because like if you just read, you know, it's gonna confuse you. You're gonna um, yeah, yeah. not answers. just get him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Follow yes. whatever he says. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Yeah, some of our clients are calling me right now. So let me just um, change the screen back to just the two of us. Thank you so much, Sharif. So I'm sure many of our friends um, got um, felt enlightened with that. And I can see, um, Anthony, if you want to share some of the comments um, of our clients and our viewers. Yes. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, essentially we are... Um, so, so one person said, looking at the dates for India, it would take 20 years to get a green card for someone who would file under EB2. I I, I agree. Yeah. If you're filing EB2 or, I mean, uh, Abhishek made a comment here. And I would say um, it's not just looking at August bulletin to determine that you would be waiting for 20 years to get a green card. The, even if you look at July bulletin, even if you look at, you know, any previous month for India, EB2 is a disaster. EB3 is an even worse disaster. I uh, think that ultimately the only solution is 
probably they need to do something with country quotas and they need to increase the amount of uh, employment based visas that are available. Um, that's what would, you know, solve this issue. Now, we're not going to see any kind of, you know, in political season and, you know, that requires Congress. So absent any movement in Congress, which is highly unlikely, um, I think that you're better off reaching out and finding a way to uh, position yourself to do a self petition under EB1A. Um, so, so that's, that's the situation. And uh, Emily Marshall made a correct statement that the um, filing dates would be when you can start to, you know, uh, uh, send out documents and, and information or civil documents. Again, I think we're targeting this message mostly for people who are already in the United States who are trying to do adjustment of status. Those are, um, you know, the, the folks we're looking at, not necessarily the, um, uh, not necessarily those filing with consulate processing. So that's why the most important document would be the USCIS adjustment of status bulletin. Um, so good. I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. Mary, any other questions, any confusion, any ideas, thoughts, or, or, you know, last, last, uh, comments. Um, so, well, I, I do have like a few comments here, but it's very, um, like country specific, like what advice. So I, I guess I, you know, I, the best advice I can Go give them. I, I have, we could, we have a few minutes. Okay. So like, um, so, so just to be, just to be clear, um, would it be if, if I'm not, um, if I hold two, um, citizenships, Indian and a different, um, um, country, can I still be able to um, apply via the EB1A route and file adjustment of status just to um, just to circumvent? Um... No, unfortunately, the way that the government determines eligibility of, uh, you know, visa is based on birth. So it's the country that oh, you, it's called okay. chargeability. So chargeability oh. is based on birth for the most part. Now, if you are, for example, from India, and you marry an individual whose chargeability is to another country, such as, you know, they marry somebody from, you know, um, let's say, you know, Europe, right? Mm -hmm. Then because of cross chargeability between spouses, a an Indian uh, national who has a employment based, like, for example, second category approval, can use the chargeability of his spouse or her spouse wow. who would you know be from like whatever you know italy that's or really good sweden or something. wow that's really amazing thank you attorney sharif so that's really good advice and so basically just to sum it up um well we don't want our clients to be discouraged right so many of them i'm not advising yeah. that indians marry non-indians to, <laughs> to advance themselves out of the visa <laughs> But yeah, if you're like, you know, one of the few people who are in that position, you can take advantage of that position already, right? Yes. Great yes, to know can. that. Um, so we have like a few minutes with Tony Sharif. So maybe, um, you know, a bit of like maybe encouragement for some of our clients, especially those from India and China who, I mean, we can say are, are like most affected by this situation, right? Maybe, you know, maybe we can encourage them to take matters in their own hands again. And would we advise them to maybe hang on for the next two or three months? I, I advise them to play the long game. I advise them what I've been advising everybody for the past decade. Play the long game. I mean, look, are you going to sit, like Abhishek said, 20 years, 30 years, 40, more than 20 years, 40 years in an EB2 backlog or an EB3 backlog? And and then you're going to, oh, I'm so anxious. I need to, you know, uh, I can't wait. I can't, you know, I can't sit still. I can't sleep. Be strategic. Be cold-blooded. Get, mm -hmm. um, you know, a uh, make an approach to your case that is um, thoughtful, that is interesting, that is strategic. Um, and we have a track record of moving people who never thought imaginable that they could be approved under EB1A category yes. and, you know, brushing them off, uh, you know, kind of, you know, presenting their case in such a way, because I think most of the time people don't realize how talented they really are and how great their work actually is. So, you know, we feel very confident that anybody that has a, 
um, you know, pathway to EB1A that we could clear it out for you and we can uh, position you to get um, approved for it. So, but, you know, if you think that's going to happen in a month or two and that you are maybe, you know, a uh, software engineer that's, you know, maybe earning $150,000 uh, or, or up to, you know, less than 200000 and, you know, you it's just going to be a magical thing that in two, three months, uh, you know, I'm going to go judge a few Cody awards or, or whatever Globy award, and I'm going to get approved for EB1A. You must be out of your mind. Mm -hmm. You are wasting your money. You're being hoodwinked and tricked. That's not how you get an EB1A approved. I'm sorry to tell you, there are no shortcuts. And the only way that you could do it is strategically sound legal approach that meets the plain language meaning of the statute. You have to look at the statute, you have to look at the law, and you have to say and find how do I meet those statutory and legal requirements. And again, play that, you know, game, uh, the long game, don't think of just, you know, day by day or week by week, be strategic, be strategic in your life, you have a lot at stake, you have families, and you want to make sure that you're positioning yourself in the best possible way. Oh, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much, Attorney Sharif Silmi, the one and only. And so to those who are watching, thank you so much for being with us today. And what he said, take um, the first step in the right direction by consulting with us. That's www.silmilaw.com. So um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Attorney Sharif. Thank you so much, everybody. And just very quickly, oh, sorry, um, one of our um, viewers commented, um, get an American child to sponsor you. No, I mean, that that's eventually a great idea but again we have we're here for you um take matters in your own hands well, well the sad thing is a lot of them you know their children are practically american i mean they've been in america since they're two yeah. three years old mm -hmm. and if they're sitting in the backlog they're gonna be they're gonna age out and and you that's know so uh, i'm sorry that sounds like white privilege to me when you say get your american child to sponsor you so i reject that statement yeah and it's and you have to wait like what 20 21 23 years so that's that's some people don't understand the plight of immigrants, unfortunately. I know, but um, you know there are many other ways, um, and we, Attorney Sharif, and of course our team are here to help you. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in our next videos.